International politics is a very interesting uh, environment. It's extraordinarily dynamic. Most of us think of it as a static environment. Nations are set in the current format. A small change in those nations occurs very infrequently or should, in effect, be opposed. And we have a theoretical structure that drives this particular phenomena, which we like to think in terms of balance of power, that this, if you are equal to others, that uh, should lead to some stability. And uh, if you are very unequal, you anticipate that all of your neighbors would attack you. Well, um, that's really not the reality of the international system. First, the international system is extraordinarily dynamic. We all grow at very different rates. So one of the fundamental conditions that we have right now is that what those groups that we consider to be poor, uh, the poor uh, countries of the world, are growing at much faster rates than the advanced countries of the world. So you see a major challenge of the countries which we like to call the larger ones, which you like to call BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And these societies will, in effect, overtake the G7, which we are the developed societies right now, which are mainly the Europeans, us, plus Canada. And when that happens, we are going to have a substantial number of demands on us, uh, because they have different preferences than the ones that we currently have, and they may want to rearrange the world in a way which is not necessarily the way we have arranged it up to now. So we anticipate that in the future, ah, there we go, uh, you have the BRICS and G7, and notice that we anticipate by 240 that we will have a transition. That is, the markets in the developing societies are going to be larger than the markets in the developed societies. The size of the circle tells you how productive you are. So we will outproduce the BRICS. We'll be richer, if you want to put it that way. But they will, as a whole, outproduce us. And that's a very simple equation, because there are about a billion, a little bit over, uh, people in what we now like to call the developed world. And the remaining six is in the developing, but in the organized developing world, there are about three billion between India, China, Brazil, and Russia. The second part of the international system, which is really interesting, is we're very, very hierarchically organized. Uh, we like to think in terms of nation states having sovereignty, but the truth is it depends. And it depends on your size. If you are large, you have a lot of, quote unquote, sovereignty, lots of wiggle. Uh, if you are small, you have a lot of less wiggle. So uh, Ukraine right now is confronting a much larger society, which happens to be Russia. And if you look at that uh, back there, uh, Russia is in a sub-hierarchy with Turkey and Ukraine. Uh, the US is the dominant country in the international system. The little gray area underneath tries to represent China. And uh, on the other side, you have the European Union. And they're approximately equal, and I didn't put everybody other than people over 50 uh, million people. So when you think about this, when you say, who can move the system? Why are we constantly called upon whenever a crisis happens? We're constantly ca called upon simply because we can do something. And uh, if we don't do it, other things do happen, but uh, we, we could have made a difference. We think a lot in terms of tactical problems. Everything you've heard on TV on Ukraine is tactical. The question becomes, if you look at this particular little graph, the red being sort of trying to represent the Russian position, the green trying to represent the Western position. If there is a big disagreement between the two, a resolution can be obtained through force. We sort of fight people. Uh, that's one way of resolving it. The, the other way is not to resolve it. Leave it contested, which we like to call a cold war. Okay. The other way to resolve disputes is if you agree on things. Okay. So if people on the two sides say, hey, I have a common position, we call it negotiation. Uh, there is a very um, 
popular way now to think in terms of soft power. I can basically persuade you <coughs> to change your position, and as a consequence, I will persuade you to change from here to wherever I am. But that very seldom works if you are highly committed to your position. So the, uh, so the Russians believe, I don't mean, uh, want to take their position, that Ukraine, and certainly Crimea, is part of Russia. We argue it is not. Uh, they run an election. It may be rigged. But the election says 70 to 80 percent of Crimeans support Russia. Now the question becomes, how do you then decide if this 70 percent of your population wants to be here? Should you go back the other way? And we say, well, there are other methods. By the way, this system is uh, used frequently in order to reorganize societies. Uh, the <coughs> English are running an election to figure out whether Scotland should be part of England. And uh, you know, you recall the Irish division, which to this day is contested, and on and on. So we have used this particular kind of process before. And uh, the rules are largely determined by your size. If Ukraine had been Kuwait, uh, we would have troops over there. The reason we don't have troops over there is because the Russians have a substantial superiority in that region. So let's talk a little bit about theoretically, when do you anticipate war and when do you anticipate peace? And uh, we've done quite a bit of work on this. So on this side, you can see the probability of war. On the bottom side, you see whether you are satisfied or dissatisfied. You are very, very dissatisfied. You will start conflict even if you are very small. That's what terrorists do. So that's this extreme left. But they usually don't do much. They kill a couple of thousand people, maybe even a couple of hundred thousand people. But that's very, very small in terms of the whole international system. In order to have a serious confrontation, you have to reach equality. In effect, the very condition that we constantly speak about being stability, which is balance of power, is the necessary precondition for major wars. World War I, World War II, Napoleonic period, they're all very long, very bloody. In order to be very long and very bloody, the two sides must be approximately the same. Okay. So it is sort of unusual that we keep talking about balance of power leading to peace, which is what you read in the New York Times. But what's interesting on the war side, on that extreme one that we're going to be talking about in a minute, is that there are two conditions. If you cooperate, if you reach an agreement, you're going to have stability. If you reach serious disagreements, then you're going to have the preconditions for conflict. And this is why Ukraine is so critical today. Take a look at the actual relative sizes in that region. Remember, we had the regional and the global. So in that region, uh, the Soviet Union, the red little line, is humongously larger than Ukraine. The only competitor in the region is Turkey. And uh, Turkey isn't paying any attention to it. All of the other people are outside the region. They're global. And the critical interest you have to ask, is this a global issue or is this a regional issue? And I am certain that it is a global issue because it is now on the third page of the New York Times. If you looked at it from the global perspective, you would notice, see that line in the middle? That is uh, today, 2014. The green line at the bottom tells you the productivity and the size of Russia relative to others, and so are the others. So you can notice that uh, we are much larger, the Europeans are in pink, we are much larger than the Russians. Even the Indians are larger than the Russians. The reason we have the perception of Russia as being so large is because we think of them prior to 1989 when they were the Soviet Union. They're actually a relatively small country, but they have nuclear weapons, so we pay attention to them. But this is the future of the international system. 
China will be the single most dominant country in the international system by 250 at the time where most of you will reach my age. Okay? So it's a, it's a short period of time. It's a massive transformation of the international system. Not a small one, but a humongous one. It hasn't happened since the Industrial Revolution that a poorer society would be massively larger than an advanced society. So now let's get back to Ukraine. Uh, see that little gr green dot in the middle? That happens to be Ukraine. This map exaggerates Russia because it's so close to the, to the uh, <coughs> poles. But that red area there, uh, I tried to make China slightly different, but it didn't come out as well. Anyway, uh, the big red area that you know is Russia. And the blue area is the European Union. Okay. What's interesting about that one is that uh, the fight over Euro-Asia has led to every major conflict in the international system that we know of. It hasn't been over North America, hasn't been over Australia, hasn't been over Africa, it has been in Euro-Asia. That's why we pay so much attention. And that's where the whole concentration of population is. It's the humongous concentration. We just don't think of them that way, because for some period, artificially, we have been larger than this particular region. The blue area are the European Union, and uh, the Soviet Union is on the other side. Now, if you went back to the 12th century, the Mongols controlled all of that red, red area, and they tried to get the rest of Euro uh, Europe and failed and then retreated. <clears throat> Napoleon tried to get the blue area and sort of extended a little bit into Russia and, as you know, failed. Okay. So those areas have been basically integrated at periods of time. Uh, then uh, Hitler, with the last one, uh, basically controlled the blue area plus some of Russia, the f a little piece of that, plus Japan coming from the other side controlling about one-third of China. But that whole group has never been integrated. Except in a very short period in which communism, after 1950, dominated the re re green area as well as, as well as China, and even portions of Europe. But that collapsed in 1957 when uh, China pulled out, and definitely collapsed in 1989 after the Soviet Union uh, broke up into its current uh, structure. That was a traumatic event in international politics, one that is really still revibrating. But the cri critical question here is, the blue area is developed, the red area is developing, and the question is, which way do you go? Do you join the relatively rich in the hope that they will carry along? Or do you join the deprived and dissatisfied in order to contest? And that is why Ukraine is so critical. Because the invasion of the potential partition of U Ukraine, which already happened in Crimea, and by the way, we did not react to it, and the possible invasion of East Ukraine will lead to a separation between us and the Russians. Whether we fight over it or not is irrelevant. What is relevant is, are we going to see them as potential partners or potential competitors? It's very, very difficult to think of them as potential partners if they invade Ukraine. And that would recreate the Cold War, but under very different conditions. So these are the choices that face Mr. Putin. He can try to accommodate and eventually get into the European Union, which is what Yeltsin attempted to do at the Helsinki meetings, and we said no. And that would mean in getting into the European Union for the Russians as well as into NATO. And we said, well, not now. We'd rather take the Poles and Hungarians, but not you. And that particular accommodation is feasible. So then you would have a very large grouping 
And now you'd have to negotiate with that green little area, which is China, which has a billion population. So it would be a billion people plus a billion people plus us. That would create a hierarchy of satisfied countries. And that would potentially, by these models, lead to stability. Alternative two is the one that is most likely emerging right now. And that is Mr. Putin is challenging us, and he is then likely to come close to the Chinese positions. And why would he come to the Chinese positions? Because he has no alternative. Russia is an energy exporting country. Currently, all of their energy is being bought by the Europeans. If the Europeans don't buy their energy, the only place they can sell it to is China. There's no other option. So if that were to happen, remember the BRICS societies? The BRICS are now getting together. And people who are dissatisfied when they get together, they usually talk about their dissatisfaction. Not about ways of settling things, but what have you done for me lately? Or how have you, you know, picked on me lately? So the likelihood of confrontation between NATO and EU vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China and Russia is critical. But let's look at one more, and I will get you free of these graphs. Okay. This one is a little bit more complicated. It gives you the productivity, which is the circle. Okay. GDP is on the y-axis, and the other one is population. And the reason you're trying to put all of those is population is the base of your future capabilities. If you don't have populations, you can't expand. You have to take care of them. Notice that the green one, which is the combination of China and Russia, would be dramatically larger than the West, because they would have a billion people plus. But their productivity would be lower, substantially lower. So you'd have a lot of relatively poor people, very powerful, highly coordinated, and potentially dissatisfied. The pink grouping is the combination of the European Union and the United States. So notice that these two, because of the blue, the US and the European Union are approximately the same. That's partnership. Okay. So the Russian choices are really critical for them. Think of it this way. If Russia joins China, Russia is an enormously small country compared to China. So they would be the same as Mexico joining the United States and say, hello. Okay. You wouldn't listen to them. The people who you would have to listen to is the Chinese. If Russia had joined the European Union, they would be the same size as Germany or France or England, and they would have one quarter vote in it. So in terms of the kind of impact that they can have future-wise for the short-term policies is uh, quite dramatic. So think about the resolution of the Ukrainian crisis, because that one will give you the future of the international system. You could talk from here to eternity about Afghanistan. You can talk from here to eternity about Vietnam. You can talk from here to eternity about the future of Israel. None of that is going to change the structures of the international system. The outcome of Ukraine can. And you may, in effect, live the consequences of that particular partition. From a theoretical perspective, the worst possible world is this one. That is, if those who are currently dissatisfied get together and coalesce and confront to those who are currently satisfied, what you would want to see is a transfer of some of the people who are currently developing, let's say Brazil uh, or India, into a developed world, just like Japan did, 
a transition from potential dissatisfaction to potential satisfaction. And unfortunately, the current actions are counterproductive. Now, we can blame the Russians, but do rec remember that in 1997, they asked to join NATO, and we said no. Why? Because we don't trust them. And, well, maybe we shouldn't. I'm not saying we should. But they see it exactly the opposite way, saying we had no option back. By the way, you have exactly the same situation right now. We have two neighbors, Canada and Mexico. We are not treating them equally. We are treating Canadians as equals and Mexicans as maybe equals, but let's put a wall just in case. Okay? That is not a very useful uh, way of extending a partnership. So I'm not trying to say that the US is always incorrect, but what is important about this is you have to look at the structures of the system into the future. Because the decisions, the tactical decisions you make right now, like Mr. Putin, who has probably become the most popular premier of Russia since uh, Lenin, God knows, okay, uh, he is now super popular. But he's super popular short term. And he may, in effect, have placed his country at the mercy of their neighbor. The, the decisions you don't make today will cost you tomorrow. You have seen the collapse of negotiations in the Middle East. 20 years from now, Israel will be smaller than their neighbors. The fact that they are not willing to negotiate today will force them to negotiate under conditions which they have far less capabilities, even with our help. This is the same kind of situation. If we can convince Putin to accommodate and then reintegrate into the West, it would be a far more stable situation for the future until we can do the same thing with hopefully China and India. Remember, political hierarchies are stable under these conditions if they are preponderant. If you reach equality, you reach very, very unstable situations. Thank you.